Regulatory issues are always a challenge. Uh, sometimes they come quickly, sometimes they take years to develop, and sometimes you can see them coming, and sometimes you can't. Uh, some examples here that I'll spend just a few minutes talking about. The National Wet Weather Policy uh, has been in the formation for at least 10 years. Uh, its release has been imminent on at least two occasions. And I can't honestly tell you we're any closer to its release today than we were 10 years ago when we first started talking about it. The good news is um, it can have major impact upon the operation of our wastewater system, uh, how we operate our plants, how our plants are constructed, what we do at our plants during wet weather events. Uh, but knowing the history and the background of uh, the last 10 years with regard to the discussions about the national wet weather policy, we took advantage of the negotiations with EPA to craft into uh, that consent decree, we think, uh, what will be the, the ultimate outcome of the, of the national wet weather policy. So regardless of when it comes about, we think uh, the improvements that we have negotiated in the consent decree and that we have underway and will be completed in uh, 2021 will indeed put us in good stead with regard to that regulation. Anti-degradation is another wastewater issue. It's been on the books for a few years, and it first impacted us uh, to some significant degree about two to three years ago when we were expanding our wastewater plant at East Bridge, at the East Bridge uh, Industrial Park. We had to make certain concessions uh, as we looked at the expansion of that existing plant that would not otherwise have been required. Those are concessions uh, and issues that we'll face any time we look in the future at expanding an existing plant or uh, trying to add a new plant to our service territory. Uh, it will make anything from expansion to total replacement very, very difficult. Not impossible, but difficult and costly, more costly than it would otherwise have been. Emerging contaminants, uh, a lot of what we talk about when we, when we focus on emerging contaminants has to do with pharmaceuticals, personal care products, things that uh, the uh, increasing technology today shows us are in the wastewater or in the river or in our drinking water, things of that nature that have not been detectable in the past uh, are now detectable and the debate is uh, at what level should they, be should they be regulated, can they be regulated, and to what extent. Those type of issues with regard to emerging contaminants are likely to have impacts upon not only our wastewater treatment plant, but our water treatment plant as well, as we try to address those issues on both ends of the pipe. Lost water is, a, is something that's been in the industry, water industry, for years. Uh, it's been talked about, it's been measured, it's been monitored, it's never really been regulated. Uh, and it, came to light uh, as a potential regulation about 18 months ago uh, as a result of the Comptroller's Office looking more closely at uh, what utilities were reporting to them uh, on an annual basis for lost water. In its simplest form, lost water is, a, is just a measure with a few puts and takes, but a measure of the difference between the water you produce and pump at the plant and the amount of water you're billing for that the customers are using. Now, there's a few little nuances in there, but in general, that's what it's trying to measure. Uh, and from the regulatory standpoint, it is a, a metric, if you will, a target that is a measure or an indicator of how water type your water distribution system is. So if you got a lot of lost water, one of two things is happening. Either you're not doing a real good job billing, or you're losing water through leaking breaking pipes and things of that nature. Um, lost water has been calculated a number of different ways and there hasn't been a lot of uniformity. The new regulations establish how it will be calculated uh, so that everybody's on the same playing field. And it establishes maximum, 35%. And so currently we're below that, uh, but not much below it. But it is a target we now have to pay a lot of attention to and focus on, and some of our asset management efforts will be directed at driving that number down lower, uh, as well as just the timely replacement of assets. 
Distribution system integrity, uh, that's the one, other one I'm going to touch on, and I'll touch on that very briefly. Uh, it is a gas regulation. As you know, we're heavily regulated in gas. But this is a new regulation that will require us to do a great deal more inspection, uh, monitoring, record keeping, um, basically being able to uh, produce on demand all kinds of information about our system, what type of pipe, what size pipe, what age pipe, the date it was installed, who installed it. A lot of things that we currently uh, have records on to a degree, but just a much greater degree of, of knowledge and information upon uh, about our gas system will be required going forward. Customer, customer expectations always uh, is something that we have to be focused on. As utilities, I think in the past it would have been safe to say that primarily uh, we felt like customers wanted quality product, reliability, high reliability, and a fair price or reasonable rates. And that was true, and that's true today, but they also want a lot more. Our customers today are much more sophisticated, they're more technologically savvy, uh, they are accustomed and want to engage with us as a utility. They want to uh, hear what we have to say. They want to understand why we're doing what we're doing. And they want to be able to talk to us. They want us to listen to them as well. So the challenges are greater today in terms of, of customer management than ever before uh, in trying to relate to our customers and deal with their, their needs and their expectations beyond just them being able to turn on the, the switch and have lights or uh, turn on the faucet and have water. There is a lot more to it today. Customer demands and expectations are much greater. And a lot of what the customers are wanting and expecting, you can see the results of in some of our programs and what we've done of late. If you go back to 2005, the Partners Council and the PACE 10 program, the, the advisory group that we put together, uh, is a direct reflection of those customer needs and expectations. That is our Creek Rim Policy Review Panel that you all created about a year or so ago, uh, our payment kiosk at convenience stores, uh, our website, uh, all of that is a direct result of trying to meet those increasing customer expectations for input and communications and opportunities to, to better uh, deal with our customers and make it more convenient for them. Getting back to the infrastructure itself, the American Society of Civil Engineers looked at uh, the nation's infrastructure as a whole over the last several years. And I think probably, if I remember correctly, D plus was about the best grade they gave the nation's infrastructure. The most recent uh, report was a D, uh, and that's for jurisdictions nationwide. It's not uh, any specific area. Uh, they did not identify any area that was doing a whole lot better in the country than anybody else. We're all in the same boat on this one. Looking at the five-year estimates at that time, they were predicting uh, $255 billion needed for water and wastewater system improvements, another $75 billion for electric system improvements, and the information from their survey <coughs> suggested that as a nation, uh, we were only funding about 60% of the identified needs uh, for asset replacement and improvements uh, nationwide. At KUV, we're doing better than that. Uh, our overall funding levels are about 90%. Now, that's helped some by the fact that wastewater and the consent decree has uh, resulted in funding for wastewater near 100%. Gas, we'll talk a little bit more about here in a few minutes, they're at near 100%. So, if you look at electric and water as a standalone, they're down about 80%. But we're doing much better than the nationwide average. And again, this addresses the renewal and replacement of assets. It does not address the need for new technology or technological advances such as smart grid or something of that nature. If you recall back in 2007, I think it was, we introduced at that time uh, what we felt like was a program, a, a non-regulated companion program to PACE 10, uh, basically a, an approach to deal with the asset needs in electric, uh, water, and gas uh, that would work well with the uh, program that we have in place for wastewater. We were looking at the need to increase the funding levels uh, of our 
assets to speed up the pace of replacements. Uh, and that process was, was beginning to unfold and develop about the same time that the economy um, had its problems. And as a result, some of the uh, advanced funding, some of the increased funding uh, that we would have been looking for and asking for, we pulled back on. Did not feel like it was the appropriate time to push that effort uh, and go for the increased uh, revenues that would be needed uh, to support those advance uh, those uh, increased levels of asset replacement. But that program is designed, it's still in place. Uh, we're ready to implement, uh, and we'll talk with you about that more uh, next month. But it is designed to adequately maintain the existing assets to help prioritize those assets for replacement and to provide the timely replacement and renewal uh, for each of our systems. Looking at the systems uh, individually, gas is our poster child. Gas is young, it's a young system, uh, it's heavily regulated, it's well maintained, there's basically no really significant outstanding unaddressed needs in our gas system. Um, Wastewater is, is similar, but, but from a different perspective, there were lots of needs in the wastewater system, but those needs are being addressed through the consent decree, through PACE 10, the collection system improvements that are underway and have been for a number of years are on budget uh, and on pace with the timing. Uh, those will be transitioning from uh, major capital improvements uh, to more of a normal routine renewal and replacement uh, here in the next couple of years. And Julie Childress will go into that in more detail uh, when she talks with you next week, next month. Um, on the plant side, as Ms. Roach indicated earlier, uh, the plant work we've got until 2021 to complete, but we've already got a couple of plant projects out for bid, uh, and we'll be beginning that significant plant work uh, here in the next few months. On the electric system, uh, electric system, we've had a number of maintenance programs and uh, capital programs in place for a number of years. Those have been effective in meeting our needs, uh, but there are certain needs that have not been fully addressed uh, now and that we think it's time to begin to address those a little bit more completely. We'll be focusing uh, going forward on some of our large transformers at our substations. We've had a pole replacement program for years, but we want to pick up the pace on the pole replacements. Uh, and underground cable. A lot of the underground cable installed in the mid-60s to um, mid-80s is now needing replacement. Uh, and we want to start that process and do so in a timely manner to ensure continued reliability of those areas served by some of the underground uh, system. Water is probably the area we've talked the most about over the last several years. As you know, uh, our water distribution system uh, is aging. Uh, we've got a good, strong, reliable plant at the uh, Mark B. Wicker facility on Riverside Drive. We've had a number of projects over there in the last 10 years that help that uh, system or that plant uh, maintain its reliability, increase its capability, and improve uh, the treatment uh, system that we have there. We've got another project underway today. We've got another project under design. And once those two are completed, we'll be have the major capital needs at the plant uh, pretty much taken care of and can, can kind of put that on the back burner for at least a little while. But the system, the distribution system itself, about 12% of our 1,400 miles of pipe is 80 years old or older. Uh, some of the larger the <coughs> size pipe, the mid size pipe, is cast iron. Uh, that's some of our oldest pipe in the system. We would like to get it out. Uh, it is in relatively good shape, but it has got a lot of age on it, and it's approaching the end of its useful life. Uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum is some of the, the pipe that's not all that old. It's much smaller diameter, but it's the galvanized pipe. And what we found out, and what Julie will say, will tell you more about uh, next month, is we discovered it is leaking a lot more than we expected it to be. And so those two types of pipe 
are the types of type that we want to prioritize going forward to get out of our system to help manage our assets better and to help drive that lost water number uh, down to more acceptable levels. I talked about, uh, I promised you something on smart grid. Um, smart grid is something that depending upon who you talk to, it, it can be all things to all people uh, and different things to different people. It is a high cost infrastructure. Uh, it does provide flexibility. It provides operational uh, opportunities and options. Uh, it provides customers with an opportunity to better uh, understand and manage their consumption. Uh, but uh, it is not something at this point in time that we have included uh, to any significant degree in our five-year plan. We do have a uh, pilot project underway in the UT area. We got a grant for that project and that work is underway. It gives us an opportunity to uh, better utilize the system, see how it fits with us, how it works for us, how it's received by our customers. Uh, so we're very happy about that. On the other hand, uh, to take that system and to include a full and complete smart grid across the KUB service territory, uh, across all four services, uh, would, is currently estimated to exceed $140 million. So it is not something that is uh, that we will go into lightly. It is obviously something that we think um, there will be a point in time when we have a smart grid. We have components of one today, even in the absence of our pilot program. We have some components of a smart grid on our electric system. Um, and we have some capabilities that a smart grid